How did you get into software? Sure. So I went to school out in Colorado at the Air Force Academy, studied computer science. Okay. Uh, they had a really great computer science program. Learned a lot of um, a lot of things about hard algorithms and you know solving difficult problems. Went on to grad school after that. Uh, studied more computer science, in particular uh, genetic algorithms, evolutionary computation, machine learning. Okay. Um, so it was very much a data mining background. I uh, went on to spend some time in the military and tr transitioned out as a defense contractor for a while in Northern Virginia. Okay. And just recently, back in October, I moved to a suburb of Nashville, Tennessee, okay. in Franklin. Um, I work for a company called Digital Reasoning Systems, and it's uh, very much a cutting edge company, uh, especially for Tennessee and, you know, somewhere not on the West Coast. Okay. Uh, we're getting ready to open up a very substantial SDK for semantic uh, basically, you could think of it as just a semantic web API okay. um, that's going to allow you to do a lot of interesting things with data in a way that we, ha we don't think we've really seen realized um, as, as full as it could be so far on the web. So you'll be able to uh, categorize text as a particular kind of entity. You'll be able to build out associative networks okay. of you know what's related to what in a document. Um, you'll be able to really mine and pull out semantic meaning from, from documents in a way that doesn't assume any a priori notion of what the text means, so it's very much language agnostic. Okay. And uh, what is your role at Digital Reasoning Systems? Uh, I'm the Director of Advanced Technology, which basically means that if something doesn't fit in the box very well, okay. it kind of gets punted over to me uh, for rapid prototyping or evaluation. Um, it's, it's a lot of the, the more cutting edge aspects of, okay. of what we do in that I, um, I get to take the company's core technology and productize it, try to put a wrapper around it that makes it uh, viable for demonstrations, prototypes, uh, selling it to customers. So you kind of get to play it for all the, with all the really cool technologies for fun. That, that's exactly right. So awesome. yeah, we, we have really interesting data sets, get to hack on those. And then, um, you know, Dojo is, is great because we build UIs around this and you're able to put a UI around something pretty quickly with a, a good JavaScript toolkit. So I get to use Dojo quite a bit in my day job. Okay, excellent. So um, actually tell me a little bit about the book. Um, who's the target audience? Uh, the target audience, uh, I'd originally set out to sort of hit the, the lower, intermediate, advanced beginner level. Uh, someone who knows how to write JavaScript, someone who's developed a web app or two in their life, maybe you know just a few web pages even. Okay. Uh, just the rudimentary knowledge, they have that part down. And so at that point, maybe they want to do something more substantial. Maybe they're t tired of reinventing the wheel and working around browser quirks and um, spending time on tasks that really aren't that productive or that interesting, you know, the, the right. tasks that prevent them from really getting to the core of what they're really about. And so uh, Dojo's great in that it, it allows you to bypass a lot, of, a lot of that stuff that originally took you, you know, hours and hours to work around. Okay, great. So um, we keep talking about Dojo. What, what is Dojo? Let's, let's clear up our vocabulary right. and so, terminology. Right, so Dojo's a JavaScript toolkit for uh, developing great UI experiences on the web. Okay. Uh, it's very much a unified toolkit in that it has a lot of breadth and depth. So on the one hand, um, you, you have a lot of breadth in that there is, there's sort of a, a core library you could think of as the kernel of the toolkit called base. There are add-ons that are still very much JavaScript standard library type add-ons that we would sort of uh, call core, additional modules you can pull in. Okay. Then there's an entire widget system that's built on it called Digit, which is short for Dojo Widget. Okay. Um, it's fully accessible, internationalized, so this is something that's very, very industrial and heavy duty in that sense, uh, degrades gracefully. Okay. Uh, but there's also Dojo X. It's a, a collection of sub-projects that don't necessarily fit in a nice box. Um, they're, they're experimental in some cases in that they're sort of being incubated and vetted out, but in other cases they're, they're very much mature like the 2D drawing API called Graphics that I gave a talk on yesterday. Okay, okay, great. Actually, um, let's back up just a little bit. Tell me a little bit more about uh, Digits, because that sounds yeah. Very sort of component based and reusable. Yeah, Digit is, is a very substantial piece of the toolkit. Um, the project lead for that's Bill Keys, who okay. uh, actually lives in Japan and, and works for IBM in some capacity. Okay. Uh, Digit is 
So there are three primary components to Digit. There's, there's sort of a collection of form widgets, a collection of layout widgets, and a collection of application widgets. And in the book I wrote, I sort of broke them out that way into three distinct chapters. Uh, the form widgets are very much drop-in replacements for um, all of the normal HTML form elements that mm -hmm. you've, you've seen and used, I'm sure. sure. Um, they save you a ton of time in that uh, you, you get a lot of the nice things that you would want out of a form from the desktop experience. There's a lot of built-in validation. Um, there's a lot of bells and whistles that okay. are added on uh, for, you know, like really advanced combo boxes that you can customize and configure and okay. um, hook up to data stores and ex through XHR and, and all of that good stuff. Okay. The, the layout widgets are, are very much uh, sort of similar to what you'd think of in terms of uh, a layout in which you don't have to necessarily dig and dive and learn all sorts of CSS tricks to right. to get something that um, seems pretty simple, but when you get right down to it, it may not be quite as simple. There's a fantastic uh, digit called border container that basically gives you, um, you know, you can have a header, a footer, and then three split panes with you know, you drag them around and you sort of have the three columns in the middle and you get that for the cost of dropping in a tag into your HTML file. You don't have to really think that much more about it. And can I control all of those with CSS and make them look and feel the way I need to for my application? Sure, so um, Dojo comes bundled with uh, several themes for Digit. Uh, okay. There's uh, three substantial ones at the moment. But yeah, um, the themes are, are pretty well laid out in that you could look at an existing theme and, and start to override pieces of it that you wanted to okay. override or just create your um, whole theme altogether from scratch. And tell me about the application widgets. Yeah, so the application widgets are, are not necessarily controls that you would see in uh, the traditional sort of HTML form spec, but mm -hmm. they're, they're more advanced in that you might see menu bars, you might see uh, drop-down menus, um, you might see the tree digit. It's, it's a very powerful hierarchical view of uh, arbitrarily nested levels okay. you know, in this tree that can hook up to a data store. So um, I like to think of the application digits as uh, what really can add some value to your application in that it can very closely mimic the desktop look and feel. Um, you can get away from just the combo boxes and just the text boxes and the buttons. Okay. That, that's great. What, um, what gap do you think Dojo fills in software development? What, why did it need to be created? What, what does it do that is um, you know, a value add? Right. So, I mean, one thing is that o over the years, you know, various browsers have developed various quirks, and some are very long-lived. Like IE6 is a very long-lived browser. Sure. Uh, Alex Russell gave a talk, and you know, he went as far as to call it the boat anchor of the web, and that there's so many people who use it. Sure. Um, uh, it's still supported, I believe, as of XP Service Pack 3, so it's still around. So in a lot of ways, something like that might be your lowest common denominator. Well, you know, Firefox has some quirks as well that are known, and so does every other browser. So the great thing about Dojo is that it, it allows you to develop against one API okay. and target sort of the web as a platform, as opposed to having to know about all those idiosyncrasies okay. and working around them on your own, which ultimately boils down to not reinventing the wheel over and over, because if you develop your web app and you have to work around some frustrating bug, say in IE6, right. and I have to do the same thing and someone else does as well, it may as well be a community-maintained solution and become more of the common uh, infrastructure that, that right. we all share and build upon instead of all having to maintain it separately. Right, so developers can kind of focus on the business logic they need to implement as opposed to boilerplate code for compatibility. It, and so exactly, on. you get to spend more time on what matters, you know, what's actually going to um, you know, okay. bring in the revenue for your project or really excite your users versus trying to lay something out and you know, finding out that there was this you know, okay. bug in a, a JavaScript or, or DOM implementation somewhere. Okay. So. Um, as for someone who's new to Dojo, um, how easy is it to work with? What, what is the licensing like? Can I just drop the JS files and, and start working on my corporate or open source project? Yeah, so Dojo is very simple to get started with. Uh, in fact, AOL um, hosts Dojo on their content delivery network. So um, if you don't want to go as far as to actually download the source and, and set that up, which isn't hard by any stretch, but let's just say you want to you want to put something together as quickly as you possibly can, well, you can drop a single script tag in that's going to cross-domain 
load Dojo from AOL CDN. Okay. At that point, you have Dojo available, and you can start to use anything that's in the Dojo namespace, which is the only right. global variable that Dojo introduces okay. into the window. Fantastic. OK. So let's get a little bit more into the specifics. Tell me about the Dojo query method. Right, so Dojo Query is, is really a godsend in so many ways. Okay. Um, it, it allows you to query the DOM arbitrarily using CSS selectors. Okay. So instead of trying to walk a DOM and inspect nodes and determine, okay, well, you know, where's this one node in the hierarchy or does it exist on the page, it can be as simple as dojo.query pass in the CSS selector, um, which might look for a particular um, attribute that has a specific value. Right. Maybe it's a, a particular attribute that starts with a particular value. Uh, there's a whole spec out there that you can read, but um, you'll find that once you start to use Dojo Query, um, you, you save a tremendous amount of time because you, you can start to keep state in classes, in the class okay. attribute. Um, you, you know, you may not have a visible style for that, that class, but you can start to keep state and use Dojo Query to find out you know what's in what state okay. instead of maintaining a bunch of arrays or, or objects that okay. you're going to have to manually manage yourself. Okay, great. Um, tell me about the Dojo Require method. So Dojo Require is, is a means of uh, lazy loading modules into your page. So earlier we said you can drop a single script tag mm -hmm. into a page and you have Dojo available. Right, right. Well, maybe there's something that isn't in base, which is what got loaded through the Dojo.js file. Uh, maybe you want to pull in some effects that are that are in core. So you dojo.require and pass in dojo effects as the parameter, and it will go out to the server and pull that in for you, okay. and all of a sudden it's available. Um, the other thing that people don't realize about Dojo Require, though, is that um, as you as you build an app and you keep track of what you're pulling in, mm -hmm. Um, as you develop, you know, page by page or however your app is laid out, it makes it very simple to later put together a build profile with the tools and the utilities that come along with the toolkit. Okay. So Dojo Require might go out and uh, incur a synchronous call or two to the server to resolve some dependencies to pull in a module, whereas you could use the build tools, pass in the same thing that you pass into Dojo Require in okay. this build profile, uh, run the build tools, and you get a single minified JavaScript file that you can drop in in your production environment. So you might have gone from you know, 10 or 20 synchronous requests uh, back okay. and forth to the server. All of a sudden, you, you've got that down to one, and it, and it makes all the difference in a snappy page load. So that could really help with the efficiency and, and the load speed of your page. Absolutely. The user experience um, is so much better um, in a production environment with it. And it if you have a busy web server, you know your web server isn't getting hit left and right just to pull in JavaScript files. So even if you're strongly um, caching, you know, on the server level, telling the browser, "Hey, keep these files around," okay. uh, if you have a lot of new users, your your web browser is still getting bombarded a lot more than it might need to. Okay, great. Um, so tell me about Dojo and Ajax. Tell me how they play together. And um, well, let's start there. First. Sure. So uh, Dojo has a substantial API for supporting Ajax applications. There are a number of XHR okay. functions that are available. Um, all of the normal ones you would think of for REST are, are sort of pre-baked and built in there. So you have dojo.xhrget, dojo.xhrput, dojo.xhrpost. Okay. You know, for the puts in the post, you can um, you know, post a form or you can post just raw data to a right. server. Um, the, the I.O. subsystem, though, uh, is interesting in that it runs on deferreds. The, a deferred is an abstraction okay. that was um, borrowed from MokiKit, which was in turn borrowed from Python Twisted. Right, right. And it's beautiful in that um, when you have a deferred, you, you don't necessarily have to know if a callback has occurred or not, or okay. if an error condition has occurred or not. You get this deferred abstraction in response to what might be an asynchronous call, and you can start to chain callbacks and errorbacks. Um, and whether or not it's even returned yet, it, it's all going to work out the same for you. So, okay. And you can put in error handlers there to deal with any errors that come back. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, there was an evolution away from HR get to XHR from Dojo 1.0 to 1.1, I believe. Is there anything new from 1.1 to 1.2? Uh, so, uh, yeah. So I'm not aware of any new features that have been added to the 
sort of the XHR functions. Okay. Uh, but you, I think one of the features that was added with 1.1 was that instead of just the pre-built-in ones, XHR get, XHR put, and so on, mm -hmm. um, they opened up the, the ability for you to just drop in any um, HTTP method. So maybe you want to do a head function okay. on a server so you could pass in, well, it, it isn't pre-baked, so to speak, but I can pass in a head string, which okay. tells the XHR subsystem, hey, uh, run a head request instead of, you know, whatever um, okay. would have been built in by default. Okay, great. So um, let's let's uh, step out of the, the grass for just a minute. Um, tell me a little bit about Dojo Animation. Uh, you know, tell me how play and animate property functions work in in play animation. Sure. So there there are a couple of um, so. The animation is spread out between base and core. In base, there's a couple of really common ones like fade in and fade out and animate property. Uh, but in general, um, the whole animation system works by passing in a node. You might pass in a duration, um, some CSS properties, and um, you get back an animation object that you can play whenever you want to play it. Okay. And it'll just run through. So if you say, uh, maybe I want this to run over 10,000 milliseconds, and um, I, I want you know a, a duration or sorry a duration of 10,000 milliseconds, um, and I want there to be. Uh, I'm sorry, I. No worries. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, so basically, you can calculate a, a frame rate, mm -hmm. and you, you decide, well, this animation should last so many frames that, that spread out over a duration. Sure. And um, each time that animation fires, it's going to pass in some parameters to uh, an on-animate handler that um, you, can, you can make it do whatever you want to according to an easing function. OK, great. And as a matter of fact, you can chain the animations together, right? Right. So. so yeah, you, you get one animation back, perhaps uh, perhaps you, you take a node and you want to do a, a fade out on it. Mm -hmm. Well, you might also have another animation that wants to sort of implode that node by reducing the height and width down to zero right. over a duration. Well, you can, you know, um, you could combine those two together so that they happen simultaneously, so it would fade out and get smaller at the same time. Okay. Or you could take a number of animations, um, pass them into to a chain function, and get back one animation that you call, which will then fire through uh, the whole um, the whole list that you passed in originally. And that's in the Dojo FX chain, or Dojo, yeah, Dojo yes, FX Dojo FX chain. chain will do okay, that for great. you. So um, that actually architecturally seems like it has a lot of advantages because you can do like the fade out function. You can have maybe one person working on that, another person working on the implode function, maybe maintaining or tweaking that without having a side effect. Sure, yeah, I think it, it's great in that if, if you want to sort of break out the individual you know, pieces that you, you could do that amongst developers, plug them all in, okay. uh, and ultimately just have to manage that one animation that you're okay. going to play at a later time. So tell me a little bit about Dojo X. So Dojo X is uh, a collection of experimental and specialized extensions. Don't let the experimental part of that scare you off. Um, it's true that uh, some of some of the sub-projects are more mature than others, uh, but there are README files, and, and okay. I know the community tries to be very diligent about how, how far along any individual sub-project might be. Okay. But in general, this is a collection of projects that don't necessarily fit into you know, any particular box we're well. It, it may not fit into sort of base or core because it's not so much a JavaScript library function. It may not fit into digit because it's not so much uh, a mainstream control that you'd see on a page. Um, okay. it, it might be XMPP, for instance, which is you know protocol for talking to Google maybe Talk, IRC. Yeah. Right, right. Um, that was a recent extension. You can see how it's specialized. It's a sub-project, and okay. uh, it's just a great place to house all of these individual pieces. Okay, very, very cool. Um, so tell me a little bit more about Dojo's grids and charts. Um, is it true that they lazy, ro lazy load? And if so, um, you know, how do I go about um, making them not lazy load if I need to, say, print out a huge table for my user? Can, I, can it be dynamic? Well, the, the, so the grid is, is something that's very powerful, and the community is continuing to work on it to make it more and more usable. Uh, one great thing about the grid is, th is that you can hook it into different data stores. So you might um, point it to a, a query read store, which um, if you've implemented a, just a very minimal amount of server logic, it can lazy load humongous data sets. So instead of loading um, 
you know, one page at a time of a right. data table and hitting the next, 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 previous buttons, um, it will actually dynamically fetch rows as you need them when you scroll the table. Okay. So you've, um, as an application developer, that, that can be a really nice thing. Okay. Um, it can be very much uh, a better piece of the user experience as well, just to use that one scroll bar. And Okay, great. Um, tell me about GFX. So um, graphics was one of the uh, pieces of my talk yesterday. Basically, it's a, a very powerful 2D drawing API. Um, you again, just like the rest of the toolkit, you program against one API, uh, but it supports multiple backends. So in this sense, uh, if you're running it on, if you're running something that you've written on Firefox, it might use the SVG backend okay. to to draw. If you're using IE, it might. Uh, translate to VML for you, um, which okay. is, you know, NIE, it's a Microsoft right, right. thing. Um, it can also draw to Canvas. Um, you could come up with an arbitrary backend that you want to support for some reason. Maybe you have a good reason you want to write against uh, the GFX API and draw onto Flash, or, you know, okay. um, you pop in Rhino and actually write to a bona fide Java Canvas of some kind in, a, in an actual desktop application if you wanted to. Uh, there's a lot of possibilities. Okay, very. Great, that's very cool. It, it actually sounds like JoJo's kind of wonderful. Um, you recently wrote an article entitled, Why Don't You Use Dojo? So what do you think some of the barriers to entry are, and how can they be addressed? Well, um, so one thing is that uh, back before the sort of the 1.0 split, there, there, at one point in time, there was a, a code base that went up through 043, which was the latest release, and okay. there was a split. Well, back in the 043 days, I, I know some of the common frustrations were that, well, there's the API is changing a lot, and there's not adequate documentation, and uh, in general, it was a very fast pace, and it, and it really was hard to keep up with. Okay. Um, since that branch took place though, and they went from 043 to the 09 code base, and now getting ready to release 1.2, uh, documentation's improved substantially. Okay. Um, you know, there are books that are being published on the subject, this being one of them. Right. Um, the, the community has really come together in a, in a very synergistic way. There's a very active IRC channel. Okay. And in, in general, I think that the barriers to entry used to be just that, that the changing API and, and the lack of documentation. I think. Those two issues are, are being addressed uh, wholeheartedly. Okay. Uh, the community's aware and, and they really want to um, make it very easy for people to use uh, the toolkit. So that actually brings up a question. Um, where can I find the IRC channel? Where can I go to find more information about Dojo on the web? Right, so um, the canonical place to start would be dojotoolkit.org on okay. the web. That's the, the main website. Um, you can get started there. Uh, there are some pretty obvious links where you could download Dojo or okay. start to read the online docs. Okay. Uh, there are a number of tutorials. The okay. IRC channel is pound dojo, like the pound sign dojo, um, on freenode.net. Uh, if you go there on any hour of the day, any day of the week, you're going to have uh, at least a couple dozen people actively discussing or helping one another on, on topics. You don't have to be a, a power user or advanced user to go in. You can go in and just say, hey, I'm, I'm getting started and you know, for some reason I don't understand what this error means. Okay. Um, it, it's all, all uh, varieties of developer in there. Okay. Where do you see Dojo going in the future? Where do you think it needs to evolve to? Um, what, what are some features that you like to see included? Well, I think um, Dojo is, is very much um, moving in a direction in that's going to be a tough one for me to answer. Okay. We'll skip that one. Right. It is a tough question. I mean, especially if it's a complete toolkit. Yeah. Um, okay. So, um, are there any misconceptions or commonly confused areas about Dojo that you'd like to talk to? This is your uh, chance. One in particular, I would say, uh, a common complaint is that Dojo is bloated. Um, okay. I, I think back, maybe in that earlier code base, you know, the, I, I didn't use Dojo as much back then as I do now, but I understand that you know that might have been the case. Well, since then, Dojo has gotten very lean. Base, when you okay. load it into the page, over the wire, it's it's less than 30K. Okay. And actually, a couple of weeks ago, Alex Russell um, made some improvements that he blogged about at alex.dojotoolkit.org, I believe, in okay. which you can load Dojo for as low as 6K okay. and then start to bring in other pieces of base that maybe you didn't need. Okay. Um, with the whole 26K that you pulled in over the wire. So one thing about it is it's not bloated, it's not right. heavy. Um, it, it's really come a long way since the code split a while back, okay. and uh, it's been a significant increase in 
performance for that reason. So any relationship between you and Alex Rushel? Are you guys well, brothers? or? Well, you know, we laugh and say maybe we were mysteriously separated at birth and were reunited <laughs> years later by the toolkit. But no, um, actually, uh, there's no relation we know of. Um, it's just a coincidence even that my middle initial is, is A and it's Matthew A. Russell on the book. Fair enough, fair enough. Um, this is kind of a general software question, but um, what are some of your favorite authors of books? You know, what, what would you recommend to someone who's getting started in programming, maybe just leaving college? Right, so um, the Gang of Four book on, on design patterns is, is just tremendous, and, and I would recommend anyone who's writing software, that, you know, that's one that you just have to have on your shelf. Okay. Uh, one of my favorite authors is um, Alex Martelli, who, who wrote the Python books. Um, We're interviewing him later today. It, it was amazing because I was signing books earlier, and he came up and said, oh, I want one of your books. Will you sign it? And I thought, wow, you know, you should be the guy <laughs> signing my book, you know. But uh, really, really enjoy his writing. Um, the gang, like I say, the Gang of Four is tremendous. Sure. And um, uh, David Flanagan's JavaScript, the Definitive Guide, is, you know, by okay. far a reference that if you're doing web development, you want that one on your desktop for sure. Okay, great. Um, so, great, I'm sold. I've decided I'm going to have my organization adopt Dojo. How do I start? What should I do? Okay, um, so I, I think one of the first things you might want to do is make sure that your, um, you know, your employer is comfortable with the licensing, which they should be. It's uh, dual licensed under BSD or academic free license. Okay. Um, you know, those those are out there. There's a lot of discussion. They're very well understood licenses, I think, for the okay. for the most part. Um, so, assuming you've sort of gotten through those legal hurdles and you're and you're comfortable with that, uh, you definitely want to pick up a couple copies of the book. So Absolutely. you have a good reference on the shelf. Uh, beyond that, um, you know, like any other software development project, you might want to decide, well, you know, how are we going to develop against, uh, you know, a particular server? How are we going to sort of host the files? Okay. So one thing you might consider doing is setting up your own um, X domain build on a local server so that you could host Dojo in, in an analogous way to the way AOL hosts it on their CD, CDN, right. but internally. That way, everyone in the shop's developing against the very same build, the very same features. You, you don't have some developers who might be using a different version for whatever reason. That, that actually sounds like a very important question, a uh, very important point. That consistency of development, I think, is really critical. Yeah, that, that's tremendous. Um, Another, another point I would make is get involved in the community. If, if you're developing uh, with Dojo, chances are you're going to want to be on top of, you know, what are the next great features that are coming out? What's the roadmap? Right. Um, if I need help and uh, you know, I just can't seem to find the right answer, who do I go to talk to? Well, that's the great thing about IRC and, and that you can just drop in right. and ask questions. Okay, great, great. Well, we've been talking to Matthew Russell on Dojo. Uh, Matthew, thank you very much for taking time to talk to us. Well, um, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Thank you.